Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 151, recorded on March 29th, 2020. I'm Chris. And I'm Joe. Hello, Joe. Good to be connected with you. Have you noticed the web just seems a little better this week? Well, it is according to Mozilla. They've launched a new test pilot, Firefox for a better web. Yeah. I mean, I like a better web. Who doesn't want a better web? So Scroll, if you recall, is a $5 a month service that stops ads from loading on certain websites. But what's interesting about it, it's not technically an ad blocker, but rather it lets publishers know that for this user, they shouldn't serve ads in the first place when you visit. Now, while they're rolling this up, by the way, I will mention just here on the side, uh, for right now, the price is actually $2.50, so I guess it's a sale. It's an extension we're talking about here that Mozilla's introducing, which would technically work in other browsers, but the experience, they say, is best in Firefox. And the extension includes scroll as well as a, quote, customized enhanced tracking protection setting that will block third-party trackers, fingerprinters, and crypto miners. You know, the kind of setting that should just be turned on by default, uh, but that's according to Mozilla. It will work across different desktop browsers, but that aspect might be Firefox only for now. This deal with Mozilla should get Scroll, in theory, a much larger user base, but neither company would actually disclose what the financial terms were. Yeah, so it'll block all the tracking except for Scroll, who will be tracking which of these websites you're visiting so they can divvy up the money that you're paying proportionally among the websites that they support. Yeah, at this point, it's not really clear what the extent of that data is. Obviously, they need to know how long you spent reading an article to proportionately pay that publisher. This whole thing kind of reminds me of like the Brave Reward system, but there just hasn't been a huge adoption of that where this with Mozilla behind it, could see some adoption. Like, if you look right now, it's pretty light. The Verge, for example, is part of it, but most websites aren't. And um, right now, that hasn't changed. There hasn't been a lot of velocity there. Mozilla stepping in, giving it their seal of approval, maybe that changes things. Well, yeah, this is a huge vote of confidence in Scroll as a solution to the problem of how to pay publishers without loads of tracking and advertising. And surely that vote of confidence is going to bring more publishers on board. Right. That's if Mozilla still is relevant and Firefox is relevant. Is it relevant enough still? I don't know. Well, the problem seems to be very relevant. This is an issue that goes back as old as the web. How do you monetize content that people expect to read for free? Some publishers with a large audience like the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times have been successful at a paywall, while most publishers are not. Without a good answer to this question, the industry seems to have relied on very privacy-invasive techniques to really track you across all properties, to really properly monetize you. And it never really reflected on the value of content. In fact, it sort of encouraged, well, not sort of, it absolutely encouraged clickbait because more views equals more ad dollars. Whereas a system like this rewards quality content. The more time you actually spend reading and digesting an article, the more they get paid. I think the key to how this is different from Brave is that we're talking about actual cash here rather than Brave, which is tokens and, let's face it, magic internet beans. Yeah. Yeah, I think for this to really take traction with the publishers, they've got to... They've got to return real money. Maybe it's not as much as advertising, but in some cases, for some sites, maybe it would be more. They've got to really deliver results. And then I think publishers would be all in. This is a win-win. Publishers get rewarded for good content. They don't have to kowtow to advertisers. And users went out because pages load faster, they use less battery life on mobile, they take less bandwidth, and they're less privacy invasive. Or you could just use an ad blocker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you joke, but I think that's a fair point. And that's free, right? And it's all publishers. Yeah. I haven't seen an ad on a website for a long time. Yeah. And I hope, man, I hope that publishers understand that's who they're really competing with. There's some analogy here to when the iTunes MP3 store launched at 99 cents a track when you could go on LimeWire and download them for free. They had to make it super easy. They had to make it convenient and they had to make it a reasonable price. And then users switched to the actual commercial legitimate versions. Something like that could happen here, but I think publishers need to remember their real competition is not things like Brave or Scroll or whatever you want to call it. It is truly ad blockers. 
Yeah, I think the iTunes analogy isn't quite right. I think Spotify is more spot on there, really, because there's the free tier where you can, again, listen to adverts. And I think that is what killed music piracy more than iTunes. Streaming killed the download star, you're saying? (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) Yeah, I could see it. But the thing is that we already have this free, convenient way to not see adverts that involves just installing an extension, which it seems not just tech-savvy people are switched onto. So how can they make this a thing that you've got this kind of problem here in that you need to have all the publishers on board for it to really have value. Whereas if you've only got a handful, then that $2.50 or $5 a month doesn't seem worth it. And I think you've also got to convince people that they need to support good journalism and good content generally and make the argument that using an ad blocker is ultimately going to lead to clickbait and just lower the quality of the web. Right. And this is something I suppose Mozilla should be doing. This is within their remit. Whether it's going to work or not, I don't know. But who else is going to drive this forward but Mozilla? They're taking a data approach to it as well. We'll have links in the show notes, but it appears that Mozilla has been running pilots that indicate that 18% of the test users after the free period opted to subscribe. Now, 18% doesn't sound like a lot, but when you consider that the industry average is 3% and 5% is considered a massive success, 18% would suggest, and Mozilla makes this assumption, that users reflect the value in paying for good journalism. And if we give them an easy way to monetize good journalism, they'll take it. But once again, this is only available in the USA for now, as is this way with all of the new things that Mozilla seems to be coming out with for Firefox. And at the moment, it is a test pilot, but that could change relatively soon. They seem to move fairly quickly with these things. Well, something that's available to anyone that has a Raspberry Pi 4 is Plasma Big Screen. Now, I know that all your Raspberry Pi 4s are Velcroed down in your dinette, whatever that is. (laughs) Quite literally, yes. (laughs) But I've got one kicking around, so I tested this. And what it is, is a big screen experience, as the name suggests. It is the Plasma shell, but it's not a Plasma desktop. It's using the same technologies that make the Plasma desktop. And it's designed to be a 10-foot UI for smart TVs or give you that smart TV experience so you could turn any TV into it. Well, my monitor has got HDMI in and some really terrible speakers, so I was able to test it as if it was a TV. And they're calling this a beta. I think that's a bit generous, to be honest. It felt alpha quality to me. But I like what they're doing, and I think it's got potential, but it does need a lot of work. Now, what I didn't mention is the Mycroft integration, which is heavy, that integration. It is integral to it. As soon as you turn it on, Mycroft starts talking at you, making you register it as a Mycroft device. So I had to create an account and I had to type this alphanumeric thing in and register it. And that finally made it shut up. Did you try any voice commands? I did, but the Raspberry Pi doesn't have a microphone, right? Right. So therefore you need to plug a microphone into it. So I plugged my audio interface that I'm talking to you over now into it, went into the settings, selected it, and nothing. It just didn't seem to be working with it. Hmm. And I don't know, I tried everything and I just, I was like, hey, Mycroft, hey, Mycroft. And it just would not listen to me. I even tried talking to it in an American accent and that didn't work. So uh, maybe my accent was not good enough. What does that sound like? Uh, Hey, Mycroft. And it just (laughs) wouldn't have it. Yeah, that's totally it. Well, so the idea here is that Mycroft offers what are so-called quote unquote skills. Each skill takes care of a particular voice interaction. They say there's a large variety from weather to date and time and reminders to online service clients and integrations with things like SoundCloud and YouTube. And they can display information using QML inside this uh, big picture, big screen environment. Uh, if For people listening that want to kind of conceptualize what it looks like, of course, you could just check out the links in the show notes. But if you have a Android television, specifically of the NVIDIA Shield variety, this is like a really clean version of that. If you took out all of the trying to push like game stream and different services and just focused on that UI, this is what you would have. A nice, clean implementation 
of it. But I'm not surprised to hear it's early days. These TV interfaces are surprisingly fiddly, and they take a lot of work. I feel like they have a pretty good base, though. The Raspberry Pi 4 is a solid device to target. I am so impressed. Even months into using them for production servers, I am impressed. And I'm picky, and I'm impressed. It's also using KDE Neon for the base, so it's a great way to get new cute and plasma libraries in there. And then uh, Libre CEC or libcec, which allows you to control your big screen TV with a remote control. And they've tried to bring these things together along with their completely open UI stack to give you an open UI for your television. Is it family ready? Does it have that spousal approval factor? I don't think so. But I am really pleased to see something in this space that isn't Cody. Not that Cody isn't fantastic, but it's one project. Well, that's where I was going to go next with this. Do we need this? We have Cody, fully open source. The brand might be a little tainted by piracy and stuff, but it is a very, very functional, open source, full screen, big screen TV experience. Do we really need something from the KDE team for this space? Yes, I'll tell you why. Cody is so great. If I have a, a library that I want to point Cody at and I want to watch media, man, there's just no better TV video player on the planet than Cody. However, if your interest is more things like Netflix or Twitch or Plex or YouTube, or if Cody is just one of the many things you want to do with your set-top box and you don't want it to be the entire set-top box experience, that's where this fits in. And to be honest with you, Joe, it's why I still use an NVIDIA Shield. I have Cody as one of the apps, and when the job calls for Cody, I use Cody. But on that same box, I also have VLC. I also have an actual official Netflix app. I have an official YouTube app. I have an official Plex app. These are, for me, cornerstone pieces to the living room. And I, I know there's plugins that would offer me that same basic functionality in Cody, but it's not good enough for me. And it's really not good enough for the family. Truth be told, it's probably good enough for me. Uh, and that's where I could see this UI that you implement on a Raspberry Pi 4 instead of something that's like an NVIDIA Shield that's hundreds of dollars and not even available in every country. Once it gets good enough, this could replace that kind of functionality. I think my assessment's in line with yours based on what I've seen so far. It's not there yet, but I am tempted to fire it up on a new Pi. Yeah, it's something that I want to play with more, especially I want to try and get the Minecraft stuff going. But I wonder whether they'll ever get official Netflix apps and stuff like that for it. That seems a bit far-fetched to me. If you can't even get Cody working properly and consistently and not breaking all the time with Netflix, then are you really going to get an official app on a new open source TV interface? It seems unlikely. Yeah, probably not. I suppose the best option might be a well-presented web UI. Which is good enough. That's how I use Netflix. So... If it was properly embedded, it, it would be fine, I think. And it is basically just a plasma desktop underneath, so there's no reason they can't do that. You make a good point, actually. And I think you're touching on something that as a community we are not discussing because it's very uncomfortable. And that is a lot of the things we want to watch are wrapped up in proprietary services and proprietary apps. And the web experience is there, but it is not the same. Like if I'm just thinking about our home television experience, I have Amazon Prime because I've had Prime forever. I have CBS All Access because I'm going to pay for the development of Future Trek. That's just who I am. Even if I don't watch it via that service, I'm going to pay for it. So I have the app, and when it's available, I like it. I like to watch the behind-the-scenes stuff and the little mini-shows via their, their app. Netflix, yep, I got that. YouTube TV, too much, but yep, I got it. These are all proprietary streaming services that are wrapped up in proprietary apps that are available for iOS and Android that have web versions that are okay, some of them not even optional. And then there's even more services that have launched just this year. Disney Plus is an example of one that my kids love. Peacock from NBC is about to launch. There's a Hulu app. There's Spotify apps. All of these are available in some form or another via the web, but it's a neutered experience, and it's just not what you're down for when you sit down, you turn on the television, and you just want to hit a button on your remote and start enjoying content. And I think fundamentally the issue is, is these different service providers, if you'll call them that, these is essentially what they are. Now, they're, they're content as a service. They just can't be bothered to make desktop apps for Linux, and so it's hard for projects like Plasma big screen to integrate them. And 
Cody kind of gets around that with some hacky plugins here and there, but it's not 100%. And as a community, we're just not really talking about this. Maybe we don't have an answer. Well, I tend to use the web version of everything. Like the Amazon one's fine, Netflix one's fine. I don't have many of the other services, but I think they're good enough as a kind of stopgap, certainly for people like me who don't mind the odd little glitch here and there. But I think for that kind of spousal approval, family-friendly thing, maybe it's not going to be good enough. Well, even just the TV experience, because I would I would bet you're probably, what, doing that on a laptop or a desktop? Yeah, this is on a desktop with a big monitor, essentially, like a TV. Yeah, it's different when you're on a couch and you're 10 feet away, like what this is exactly positioned for, and you're doing it with a remote that has, you know, a directional control and a select button. Yeah, which I didn't have one of those to try this out. I was just using a wireless keyboard, which I always use. And you can just use the arrow buttons and enter to kind of emulate that. But then you can also alt-tab and stuff to some extent on this. So you can see its desktop roots in there. Ultimately, these challenges that we've just highlighted won't be resolved unless there is a demand for that content in that layout. And it's projects like this that will get us there. And so I will probably give it a go at some point. I may wait a few months for development, but uh, I could see here at the studio where it's just me and Wes mostly, (laughs) this would be perfect. Well, you probably want to get off that NVIDIA shield because it's running Android and Android is terribly insecure, isn't it? Hey, apparently. (laughs) Although, thankfully, they haven't figured out they can go after television apps yet. But two different malware detection vendors, just as a broad category, this week are making a bunch of noise about apps in the Google Play Store that are riddled with spyware, I guess, Um, monitoring, monetization techniques. What do you even call it anymore? Yeah, adware, spyware, there's various definitions of it. But either way, I suppose crapware is probably the best way to put it. Yeah, one of them was in 56 different apps that they checked. A lot of them were targeted at children. Surprise, surprise. And it seems like we're looking at a 1.7 million device install base here. There's a cool aspect to this, Joe. A real cool guy developer trick that they did to get clicks that looked organic on the ads they were serving up. Because, of course, users aren't necessarily going to just tap ads that show up on their device. Even if they can present them to the end user, it doesn't mean they're going to tap them. So if you could come up with a cool guy way to still get some clicks, then you're really making the money. And this round of malware (laughs) used Android's motion event mechanism to simulate clicks based on just moving around in your pocket or moving around in your hand. It would translate that to rando clicks to make it look real to advertisers. So they were able to fraud legitimate ad services like Google's AdMob. Another couple of interesting bits that I suppose are somewhat noteworthy They wrote these apps in native Android languages, you know, used Java in the right spots, used other languages in the right spots to make it look like legitimate background apps or games. And then there's the separate group, Dr. Webb, who found a whole other batch of infected apps, not even related to this, using a whole other branch of malware called Android Circle One. But hang on a second. What happened to the App Defense Alliance? This is something we reported on back in November last year where Google partnered up with three antivirus firms, ESET, Lookout, and Zimperium. And the idea of that was that they kind of pool their resources and make sure stuff like this did not happen. They'd be scanning applications that were submitted to the Play Store and monitoring them and working with the technology that Google already has and avoiding this from happening. And yet I keep reading about more and more cases where researchers are finding these malicious apps in the Play Store. In that something, three different vendors, all of which would be using their technologies to scan play submissions before they even went live. And yet, here we are. And last time on the show, when something like this came up, I just said, hands up, Android is the new Windows for end users. <laughs> Don't let friends and family use Android. Guys like you who know about lineage or people who maybe aren't looking for background changers or pop the bubble games that are going to install Android malware, they're fine. If, if that's not you, you're fine. But friends and family that are not savvy, don't let them run Android. Not only do they end up with crap phones from carriers that generally are loaded with carrier crap and underspect, but even if they get a good Android device, there's still hundreds of thousands of apps that make it into the Play Store that are riddled with crap that will make their phone slow, steal their private information, and drain their battery. 
It's yeah. not a good situation where someone on a Linux podcast is saying, essentially use iOS, not the Linux-based phone. It's really so sad. It took me a while to get to this point because I wanted to think maybe with the Pixel devices and uh, this this Android malware alliance that we talked about in November, I thought maybe finally Google will get this together. It's funny. I, I don't think I would go so far as to say use an iPhone and Android is not secure, but I think there was a time when I would have said, just stick to the Play Store and you'll be fine. Whereas now I think it's just stick to well-known applications. If you're installing Facebook, WhatsApp, you know, all of the standard stuff, then yeah, you're going to get all the tracking that goes along with that. But at least that's, um, you know, big billion dollar business tracking that's, uh, mm-hmm. no, hang on. <laughs> You're selling me on this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm really not selling myself on this, am I? <laughs> but yeah, don't go for obscure apps, essentially, and, and read reviews. And But then I suppose they can be faked as well. And the problem is, is that is great advice for people that are the type of user that listen to a podcast like this. But for my family members, like my aunts and uncles, it's just completely lost on them. If it's in the Play Store, they have the expectation that it's completely safe to install. And I would bet you my family members have been bitten by stuff like this because I've, I've, been, I've been handed their phones at family events and they hand them to me and they're hot to hold and they have like two hours of battery life. And some of them are newish. You know, they're like some big LG device with a ginormous screen and 15 cameras on the back. And they just got it for a great deal from the Verizon store. (laughs) But then what is Google to do? We get up in arms when they kick open source apps out because they don't follow the rules. But if they make the rules even stricter, then it's going to be much harder for developers to get their apps in there. Like with iOS, my understanding is that it is not straightforward at all. It's not open in the slightest in terms of getting your apps in. You have to jump through hoops to get them into that app store. But then we don't hear many stories about malware making it through the gates. No, it's mostly those billion-dollar companies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, um, like there was just some story about Zoom. Even if you didn't have a Facebook ID, the Zoom iOS app was sending your information to Facebook, and they just fixed that. But that, that kind of stuff happens all the time on iOS. Yeah, it's tricky because it, how often do you hear about Google having an issue around executing at scale and scope? Like, that's not generally their thing. They don't generally have issues executing at scale. But with the Play Store, it seems like they are. Well, maybe they'll have an answer for this at Google I.O. Oh, hang on. No, that's not happening this year. Ah, too soon. Yeah, to be fair to them, it was a sensible decision. And a quick update on something that we reported on last week, and that is Chrome and Chrome OS releases, which were paused, but it seems only for a week, because instead of just security updates, they're going to continue on with... Chrome and Chrome OS updates. So what was the point of the pause? It's not like a week is enough time. If somebody in their area was going to get sick, it could still happen. It's not like Corona is gone. Maybe they just were pausing to do an assessment of what resources they had, and maybe they did the math and worked out that if a certain number of people go down, you know, they'll be all right. So, yeah, a bit strange. Yeah, you know, given the benefit of the doubt, maybe they were preemptively over-communicating expectations, saying, hey, as we go remote, we don't know as a team what we can deliver. Oh, by the way, we're remote now. I think we've got our feet underneath us. Okay, we're resuming normal operation. Interesting, though, that Microsoft are not going to be releasing Windows preview releases in May because of all of this. So maybe Google's a little bit more agile than Microsoft. Oh, Microsoft, always slightly behind the trends. Well, a company that tried to ride on the trends was Telegram, and they had this huge ICO, $1.7 billion of investment, and they've been struggling ever since to get their coins out there. They call them grams, struggling with regulators. And this week, they were dealt a serious, serious blow, which looks like it might be the end of this project. Not just the end of the project, but spell serious long-term trouble for Telegram. This week, a federal court judge sided with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission against Telegram and granted a preliminary injunction against that $1.7 billion initial coin offering. In an opinion, an order filed on Tuesday with the New York Southern District Court read a spot in the United States that is very aggressive against cryptocurrencies. The SEC has shown substantial likelihood of success in proving that Telegram's plan to distribute grams is offering securities. And they have a test called the Howey test, H-O-W-E-Y, so Howey, Howey. Um, And essentially anything that meets this test is considered a securities. And the Telegram 
Graham in their quote unquote emergency filing. They have an emergency filing, Joe. It's, it's an emergency. They say it clearly meets this test. And so they're clearly essentially trading on the idea that if you bought in now, you could sell for a higher rate later to a bunch of people, which is true. That's hard to argue. Yeah, that's the whole point of an ICO, right? You sell a bunch of investment in your cryptocurrency low, and then once it launches, the value goes up, and then you cash out and make a bunch of money. It's basic investment. But they were trying to argue that it wasn't an investment, and they just have lost. Yeah, and the SEC is arguing the Telegram knew all along. They understood that purchasers would not be willing to pay $1.7 billion to acquire grams merely as a means to just store and transfer value. Telegram recognized and developed a scheme, according to the SEC, to maximize the amount of initial purchasers and would be willing to pay by creating a structure to allow these purchasers to maximize the value they receive upon resale to the market. In other words, they knew all along, they built it this way, and that proves their case. So Telegram has been served an injunction that prevents them from issuing grams or doing anything with the cryptocurrency until after their hearing. They could fight this, but it is extremely unlikely the Telegram's going to fight this. And it is very likely the Telegram will end up having to pay the money back, which they don't have. They don't have $1.7 billion just sitting in a bank account. The guy behind Telegram is rich, but he's not that rich. And if Telegram is ordered to pay it back, they're going to face a very particular kind of painful situation. Yeah, I'm thinking, uh, do we move to Signal, WhatsApp, or what? We use Telegram heavily. I know. It would really be a shame to see Telegram go away. But I think in the back of our minds, we've always wondered, what's the end game here? What's the monetization strategy? Yeah, I talk to everyone on that. Like, all my friends basically are on there. So I'm sure we'll all move to something pretty quickly if it does go away. But it just seems strange to think that all our chat history and everything will just be gone. And surely not. But $1.7 billion is a lot of money. Time to start a people's movement to open source all the Telegram. Yeah, there's been various open source bits of it, but maybe if the back end was somehow open sourced and federalized, we could maybe keep it going peer to peer. It seems uh, a long shot, though. Yeah. Plus, you know, Vlad's got a really good internet connection in his basement. So you got to go down to Putin. You got to convince him to get the server out of there and put it up like on DigitalOcean. It's going to cost. <laughs> well, whatever happens with this and everything else in the world of free software, be sure to check out linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get new episodes. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact for ways to get in touch with us. And if you haven't checked in on the user error show recently, check out user error 88, error.show slash 88. It's titled, well, comma, actually, and I think that explains everything you need to know. It's a great episode of the user error program. Yeah, I think you need to do it in the proper voice. Well, actually. <laughs> yeah, you guys know what we're talking about, and it made me smile from beginning to end. We'll be back next Monday with our weekly take on the latest Linux and open source news. You can find me at chrislass.com. And you can find me at charles.com. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week. See you later.